Over 50 years ago, his father and a friend started a small business selling health supplements out of their homes. Today, it's one of the largest privately held firms in the country and one of the most international enterprises in the world. Doug DeVos, president and co-CEO of Amway, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. That's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television Midtown Detroit studio. I'm Larry Phobes. Doug DeVos leads a company of 14,000 global employees selling through 3 million independent business owners from their headquarters in a township of about 10,000 residents. Thanks for being here, Doug. Great, thanks, Larry. Great to be here. Um, when your father and uh, Jay Van Andel started the company, what was it like when they started? What can you remember about the early days of the company? <laughs> well, I remember being small. And I remember everyone being in our little town of Ada, Michigan. Uh, we would go to employee events, Christmas events, uh, the Christmas party down there. I remember being with you know, families that worked at the company. And a lot of our independent business owners would come to our homes. Dad and Jay would uh, entertain. And we would have jobs of welcoming them and looking after them. And, and, and we all had something to do to be part of it. Now, when I was studying the company, the, the, what, the company that became Amway wasn't their first try. They had several uh, false starts before that, which is pretty common. Henry Ford's, the current Ford Motor Company, it was Henry Ford's, I think, fourth try. Right. Is this whole idea of fluid determinism, that, determinism, that I'm going to keep looking to find the right thing, but I'm going to keep going, is, is that some kind of a characteristic for entrepreneurial leaders? I think it is. <laughs> they wanted, Dad and Jay always wanted to be in business. They wanted to be in business together. Their first business, you know, they got into business to teaching people how to fly originally, and they didn't know how to fly themselves. You know, they wanted to go to South America. They bought a boat, and they sunk off the coast of Cuba. Uh, you know, they had other businesses that failed, and then when they started Neutralite and then began Amway, that was when they got some focus and momentum and found a business uh, that, that, uh, that they felt they could be successful with. If, if, you, if, if you go to the movie image for entrepreneurial partners, yeah. it usually involves a lot of yelling and arguing and throwing <laughs> of coffee cups. Is that the image you remember of Jay and your father in the early days when yeah. the company was struggling to get started? They were best friends. They were best friends from school. Uh, they, right after high school, they both went off into World War II and served, and they wrote letters back and forth about how they wanted to get in business together. And, and you know, it was one of, one of Jay's letters to my dad, Richie, you know, someday, Richie, this war is going to end. Someday it's going to get better. Someday we're going to be able to make it. And that was their dream, and they kept working towards that. But they, they always stayed together. They, they would never blame each other when something went wrong. They never pointed a finger and said, I told you so. Even when somebody would make a mistake, they would get together and say, how do we fix the problem rather than assign the blame? So like a case study in, in how teams ought to operate. And I got, I got to grow up in that environment. We all did. My family and the Van Andel family, that's what they taught us, not just by what they said, but by what they did. And, and we had lots of stuff go wrong. We had lots of tough times that we got to watch Dad and Jay go through difficult experiences. But they always put the problem there and said, how are we going to fix it? Fast forward today, you're the son of uh, one of the founders, and uh, you're co-chair, co-CEO and president, and the chairman, another co-CEO, is the son of another one of the founders. Yeah. How do you balance the benefits of having this consistent family ownership and, and leadership so you get a nice 
fixed on, on the vision, sure. with the need for new revolutionary, where the heck did that idea come from? <laughs> that usually comes from people who have a different experience. Sure, sure. Well, there, there's a couple things. You know, I think for Steve and myself, we share the same history. We share a common value base. Um, and it allows in our partnership an ability to talk to somebody without feeling you're exposed. If I have a question, I can go to someone safe and say, what do you think? And vice versa. But we also know that there's a lot more, there's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than we are. <laughs> and we want to get the best people as part of our company. And we want to get out of their way. As long as we know where the values are and the direction of where we're going, we want to let them ex demonstrate their leadership as well. We listen to the best ideas and try to help them develop them and, and help them implement them in any way that we can. But we know that there's people with more creativity than we have, with an, with an innovative uh, you know, spark that our business needs, and we want to find it and help them find it in themselves. So even if they come with an idea that's totally foreign to the Amway method, it's well, worth looking at. Well, everything's worth looking at. Let's see what happens, as long as it's consistent with our values. We, we, if it's not consistent with our values, we can generally address that. But we're pretty clear with people when they come to the business what they're getting into, what our business is, what it's all about. Uh, and so if there's a values conflict, problem. But when it's consistent with our values, but it's just a new angle, a new way to do something, we welcome that. Let's take it to the next level. Let's develop it and see what it could be and how it could help. Because a lot of those sorts of ideas have been really important to the success of the business. You went off and did your business degree at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Got a little leadership experience being one of the quarterbacks on that, on that famous football team. I'm assuming that people on the field didn't give you any special consideration because your dad was a famous business, business uh, leader. <laughs> when you came back to the company and started working full time, how did you go about building relationships with other employees in the company because of your last name so that they you could get a good working relationship going, and they, but they didn't treat you differently or differentially. Yeah. Well, you know, to a certain extent, as we said earlier, you know, we grew up in the business. A lot of people that I started to work with, I had known before I started to work there, and, and they knew me. Uh, you know, ha being, you know, being Rich's son probably gave me a, a, an opportunity <laughs> to, to get be part of the company. But beyond that, they treated me as a, as a friend, as a colleague. And they, they judged me based on what I could contribute to the team. What could I add? What would I do? If, and, and if I was, was able to uh, be a positive impact or have a positive impact, uh, you know, bring ideas that I may have had to the team, whatever the role may have been, they accepted me, they encouraged me, and, and a lot of times they really helped me. Uh, and, and I'm grateful for so many colleagues that I worked with throughout my career who helped develop me, who had experience, and even though I was young, they, they shared it with me. Let's fast forward a bit. We talked a little bit about the company when it first got started. Give us an overview of what is the company today? What's this business, the other parts of the Altacore group? Uh, sure. Well, the company continues to be the Amway business. And our, and our you know, primarily, that is, that's what drives us, uh, giving people an opportunity to have a business of their own in, in over 80 countries and territories around the world uh, with over you know, 450 products uh, with, you know, millions of independent business owners, you know, as you said. Uh, and this, the scope of the business today has become truly global. We, we are, are, are spread all around the world, and we, it presents us with unique challenges of how to operate like that. We don't, it's not just a U.S. business with a few international affiliates. Our biggest market is outside of the U.S. The U.S. continues to be a strong market for us and a great market for us, but, but it spans beyond that. And one of the uh, aspects of your business that makes it a little bit distinctive is, is the uh, multi-level direct marketing. Mm -hmm. What's that? How does it work? <laughs> it's a, the direct selling concept is basically, uh, basically two things. You earn money, you have a, start with a business of your own, and you earn money by selling products and getting a retail margin. And then the, the magic of our business is your ability to develop a sales force, that you can help develop, train, lead a sales force, you help them make money, and then there's commissions that flow uh, to you for the work that you've done through your time, talent, and leadership that by helping somebody else earn money, you are, are, are able to earn an income uh, based on the products that they sell. You mentioned a minute ago that the company was extremely global, 90% yes. of income from, from overseas markets. Steve made a comment, Steve Van Andel made a comment a while ago that when you take the, when you change from being an international company to being a multicultural company, 
you start getting some new ideas. Right. What's the difference between the two terms and what kind of ideas come out of it? Well, in, in, in our, the way we speak of things, the, being an international company means, well, we're, we take our U.S. ideas and we plant our flag in another market. And we, we did that a lot. <laughs> when we started expanding around the world, we took the exact same products and, and did it here, and we did it there. And you know, it worked okay. But when we became global, what we started to find was that we had great management and distributor or I, uh, IBO leaders in different markets who would say, here's how we should do it for this market. They'd create a new idea. For the example, uh, make smaller uh, packaging because people can't afford a, a one liter bottle in India. You need to make it smaller so people can understand the pricing. Well, you know, that's an idea that works in a lot of markets. In China, we needed physical locations. We needed a presence in every city for every province in which we were operating. We'd never had physical presence like that before. So we created those shops and we found that our, our sales force loved it. They could bring in their customers and prospects. They could talk about the brands with confidence that they never had before. Uh, and so that idea started to go to markets around the world. And then the third I would just say is technology, being able to use technology. Uh, Korea was one of our more advanced places uh, with taking orders online uh, in the late 90s and uh, early 2000s. The, the numbers I read in, in, in your publications that 90% of your revenues today come from outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. In the 80s and 90s, it was 30%. Right. What accounts for that growth? Is it the products that you sell? Is it something about your business model that makes it attractive? Or, Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, um, I think what we were able to do is uh, attach ourselves in a variety of ways to developing economies or even developed economies, segments of developed economies that were looking for an opportunity that we were able to fill. So for example, Japan was a very uh, developed economy, but the tradition there was the salaryman and the housewife. And the housewife had a lot of talents and skills that they wanted to contribute. And so they saw our business opportunity as a way to generate income, to generate fulfillment, to apply their talents and, and, and efforts towards a productive future that they wanted. Uh, and, and so that's what happened in a developed market. In the developing markets, people are looking for opportunity. They may not have the same formal education or the opportunities. It's the sweat equity. They just need a, an, an opportunity to get started and an Amway business was the perfect fit for them. There's no or, or low or virtually no cost to get started. You get people to help you and give you training along the way. You have access to a product line immediately and it's just your hard work that gets you started. With all the success that's happening in the overseas markets, you're now in a sort of a drive to reintroduce, to re-energize the brand in the U.S. Right. That doesn't happen that very often the companies need to reintroduce a brand in their whole market. What happened? It's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> well, as we, as we went around the world, uh, we got really broad with our geographic expansion, and it was really hard to go deep. And to a certain extent, we, we lost touch with some markets as we kept moving from place to place around the world. We, we would launch as many as three or four markets in a year. We got confused. And we went back and said, okay, time out. We're now available to over 70% of the world's population. We have great markets. It's time for us to go deep. We have to drive market share. We have to build our brands. Let's work with our independent business owners and drive training so we can, so we can establish a, an awareness and a reputation in the marketplace uh, that we have not uh, done as well with in, in the past. And what we found, again, that started with some of the markets that we got into. We started to get big and get market share. And we said, we should do this in every market. So let's go back. Uh, and if we're not as strong as we should be, let's make sure we do the fundamentals, the blocking and tackling to, to be as strong as we should be. And, and the U.S. is a great example of that. We had, uh, we've been here for over 50 years, and the business today is, is growing very nicely. Over the last few years, while this has been going on, there's been some reports out in the, in the media about some of your independent business owners using suspect business practices yeah. or questionable practices. As co-CEO of a company, how, how do you lead the company so that the independent business owners can do what they need to do to optimize their results in their market with their customers, but make sure that they're still following the Amway process, the Amway brand? Sure, sure. Well, it's, <laughs> it's leadership. <laughs> you know, what we try to do, we have to get ahead of it and, and be as clear as we can about here's where we're going, and then we're going to support you. We're going to tell you where the boundaries are. 
this is acceptable behavior, this is unacceptable behavior. We're going to set the standards for, for doing things properly and, and articulate that and then train everybody to get you there. And we're not just going to say it, we're, we're going to go out and try to do it ourselves. One of the big things with our branding campaigns, um, with getting the Amway brand back out there, is that we started talking about the Amway brand and that gave an example for our sales force to say, oh, if that's what the company's saying, then that's what I'll say. When we talk about our products, our Neutralite brand or artistry brand, we go out, we uh, establish the message in the marketplace, it becomes very easy for them to, to align with that. So it, it, it's really about getting ahead and being a leader rather than just setting rules and boundaries and all that, even though that's part of it. What we found most effective is, effective is if we give the message and we're advocating, everyone says, well, I'll just do what they're doing. Uh, and and that's, we found that to be very helpful. Thanks for being here, Doug. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk more with Doug DeVos, President and Co-CEO of Amway. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Doug DeVos, President and Co-CEO of Amway, and we'll be talking about leadership and change. The firm's been around for about 50 years. It's been phenomenally successful. Are there pros and cons of being successful? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The pros are you're, you're successful and you have strengths. The cons we've found, we, and we've articulated, our greatest risk to future success is our past success. Uh, because it's too easy to think we can just sit back and let it go and be afraid of making a mistake, be afraid of making an investment that, that doesn't go well. Uh, and so what we've tried to do is really challenge ourselves to take all the strength and the learnings of the past, but challenge ourselves to be better in the future. Keep taking risks, keep making decisions, keep moving forward, because otherwise there's this tendency to just to, to hold on. And if you hold on too long, things slow down, and then you start going backwards. And so we have to keep pushing forwards. Is one of the risks that the successful business that plays in their mind is that we are successful, we're afraid of making the wrong change, and so they're afraid of something messing up the process? Sure. Well, I think everyone's afraid of that. Uh, and, and, and that's what we, that's what Steve and I try to do is say, failure's okay. You know, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all human. You know, I, boy, I make a lot of them, <laughs> you know. Uh, but let's learn from them. Let's share our mistakes so others can learn from them as well. Let's make sure we don't crawl into a, a shell because we have to be out in front. The marketplace is changing, and if we just get stuck and we keep doing the things that were successful in the past, the chances are those same activities won't make us successful in the future. And our duty is to keep the business successful for generations to come. Once you make the decision to make a change and decided what it's going to be, how do you then sell it, break through the inertia of 14,000 staff employees, 3 million independent business owners, so that it actually happens? <laughs> you just do it. You, you have to get in front of things and keep doing it. You keep talking about it. You keep taking action with your management team. You keep taking an action with uh, any situation you see happening around the world. You keep articulating where we're going, what we want to do, and you keep the atmosphere right of bringing new ideas. Because if what we found is if we start to create that atmosphere, people will, maybe not everybody, there's a little inertia to stay is to stay the way it was, but a few people will bring an idea, and a few of them will fail, but when a few start to work, then everybody comes behind it. Everybody rallies around, and we've made another step forward. And then we just keep repeating the process. What's the next good idea? What's the next step forward? And, and we'll have a few steps back. We'll make some mistakes, but that we're not going to quit. We're going to keep moving forward and do, being the best we can be. You lead in the shadow of some pretty successful other leaders in the company, the founders of the company, right. right? 
But they were an entrepreneurial company. You're now a $9 billion global company. Are the entrepreneurial skills that got the company started, are those the same skills and are they interchangeable with leading a, a much more mature now global company? Well, I think those, those skills are still required. We have to be optimistic. We have to be willing to take risks. We have to be looking to the future and, and we have to pour ourselves into the business, which is exactly what Dad and Jade did. That was their life. And, and Steve and I try to do the same thing. Uh, but the business has gotten big and the, the additional component, we've had to go find some really great people who can help us be the best we can be, who can challenge our ideas, can help us change, can help us uh, advance to the future. And that's, that's the component uh, that we've had to bring together. And it's a, it's a great adventure. Uh, we've, we've, met, you know, we've had management uh, uh, you know, folks around the world who are great friends, who, who are incredible talents, who have brought uh, you know, a, a great energy to the business that we could never have done just by ourselves. And so I think it's that combination that keeps us moving forward. Let's do another comparison uh, of leadership skills. You're leading a $9 billion company that's privately held. Yes. What's the difference in your leadership viewpoint, your leadership horizon from somebody who's co-CEO of a $9 billion publicly held company? Sure. Well, the, the, the main thing is long term. We have the luxury of looking long term. We have the luxury of working through a mistake without having to explain it to an analyst or to, to the public market. Uh, we have uh, the support of our families uh, who, who are committed to the business long term and are willing to take those risks and are encouraging us to move forward and aren't looking for a quarterly return or another penny or two on the share price so they can trade it and go to another company. They're committed just like the uh, employees and especially our independent business owners. We're committed to this business and we have the ability to say, what's the market going to be like in five or 10 years? Let's spend time on that. Let's make sure we're prepared for that. We're thinking about it. Uh, and some other companies may be thinking more about the next five to 10 weeks uh, because they have another analyst reporter. They have to, they have to meet the street's expectations. Uh, and, and it can be very damaging. Some companies manage it very well and, and that model works. For some, it's a big challenge. One of your leadership attributes, uh, you're relatively open with, with the public about your personal values on, on faith, on economic development, on, uh, on uh, business in general. Sure. What's the place for personal values of a leader in a business? I mean, doesn't just the bottom line bounded by regulations drive <laughs> everything? <laughs> well, we're all people. You know, uh, the greatest asset in our business are the people in our business, our independent business owners, our, our employees. Uh, and, and so people want to know who you are and business is more than just numbers. Sure, you need financial performance and, and you have to do financial analysis and, and all the other, uh, you know, the blocking and tackling as we, we said earlier to make sure the business operates well. But people want to know who you are. Where do you come from? What do you believe? What's your value system? And we have found that, you know, students, <laughs> 20 year olds, 30 year olds are really interested in that because if they're going to pick not just a job but a career, or a business of their own, they want to know that it's going to stand the test of time. And, and you know, financial performance in a quarter or a year may or may not stand the test of time. Values stand the test of time. I've got one last question for you, Doug. One of your hobbies is you like sailing. Right. Your boat, WindQuest, run the Chicago Mackinac race last year. Yeah. Let's hypothetically put you in a different situation. You wake up tomorrow and instead of CEO, co-CEO and president of Amway, you're co-CEO and president of the company that made your racing boat. How are you going to take the leadership lessons from selling and insights from selling consumer goods to direct, direct marketing into leading the company that makes high-end, high-tech, bespoke racing boats? <laughs> well, a few things would start. First of all, it still becomes a passion. <laughs> you still, you got to love what you're doing. Uh, secondly, you, you go back and you start with the marketplace. What's happening in the marketplace? Where, you know, what's, what's moving? What are people looking for? What type of sailing or racing are they doing? Third, you, you apply the best technology can give you. You know, our research and development facilities at Amway, we would have to match in a, sail, in a sailboat company with the research and development uh, investments that you need to make so that you're using technology in the best ways. And so I, you know, I think business skills really do translate and they move from one type of business to another. Thanks for being here, Doug. Thank you. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then.
Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.